not music. Party's not a party's a man who fights crime And we're gonna watch him fight for a minute at a time With John and Will and I guess you just rhyme It's Bad Minute! Hello and welcome once again to Friday's episode of That Minute Returns The podcast where we get to the two truths behind Tim Burton's 1992 Batman Returns movie, one minute at the time. I am a Norman Bates, Ted Bundy type, uh, Niall McGowan. And here to explain the difference between the truth and the truth, it is I, John Parker. <laughs> oh my God, we've got a Simpsons reference right out the gate here with this one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, we're also here, uh, joined for the final time this week, uh, and the final time in the Burton movies, actually, as well, um, by uh, DC Cinematic Minutes, uh, Mark and Nathan. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, how you doing? Uh, yeah, and we're just here to talk about Minute 72 of Batman Returns, where things are getting, they're getting hot, they're getting sensual, but uh, it pretty much just opens with Bruce and, uh, Bruce, I was going to say Bruce and Vicky, oh my god, <laughs> oh, Bruce and Selena dad, talking. Yeah. <laughs> and ends a minute later with Bruce and Selina still still yakking away. Yeah, but also getting to know each other with the promise of a kiss. There's so many things. <laughs> there's so many things to uh, to talk about or to have questions about in this minute, um, because as, as much as I as much as I love like this movie and I, you know I. I the the romantic relationship between these two is is so uh i i'm in i'm so in love with like this relationship that happens in this film um but it is this this week is one of those that it's like i'm sorry what did you say uh bruce wayne it's it's one of those things where it's like did you just compare yourself to a serial killer? Because that's a that's a that's like the biggest red flag I've ever heard anyone say in my entire life. Um, like especially today, because people seem to have like a, a fat. Uh, people have always had an infatuation with serial killers, but now it seems to be mainstream to have an infatuation with with, with serial killers. Yeah. Go on Tumblr um, for five minutes, and, and you'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, I like in high school when I was younger, um I would have, you know, an occasional friend or occasional acquaintance who was um you know, in love with that thing. And it, you know, I understand why they're infatuated with it. Um but now it seems like everyone is aware of it yeah. and now everyone is accepting of it. And uh you know, back then I would think that this would be a big red flag, but nowadays it's probably I don't know. Is it more or less uh, alarming? Because I feel like it should be more alarming because everyone's now aware of serial killers and what they do. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. What did you say you were like? Um, (laughs) But then I'm thinking, or will they be the opposite and be like, oh, you're like Ted Bundy? I I would hope not. I've read all (laughs) six. Yeah. I I listen to serial. It probably depends on age, I'd imagine. Because I think you get a lot of like teenage fangirls writing like, fan fiction the like romantic fan fiction about like jeff the killer from creepypasta or stuff like that so but imagine by the time you're like 25 or something that's well well out of your system so maybe it, it, it is an age thing but yeah and and i think someone someone explained it the other day of like okay what is it what is with the uh the sensation or the phenomenon of all these murder podcasts and people like being in love with all these like serial killer uh, stories. And uh, someone explained it like women always fear that they're going to get murdered every day. So what's fascinating about this kind of things is they at least get to know how it's going to happen or something like, like they like, they're like, they're almost infatuated by like how, how it goes down. And these, these, it's like, it's like telling each other scary stories basically. And so it's like, it's like it's it's like uh, it's like you're scaring yourself and, yeah. and like uh, you're enjoying that. It's like real life horror stories. It's a vulnerability. Thing. Yeah, it's like telling ghost stories, but yeah. it's more physical. And so I'm like, 
okay uh weird <laughs> but okay kind of makes sense um, and so, yeah and it, it but it, again it's one of those things where it's like no i know who that dude is and uh if that's who you're like i, I think we're done here check yeah. uh, check please uh, to be fair though bruce isn't <laughs> he's not saying he is like them He's he's worried that she will think he's like them, which is slightly different. <laughs> yeah. That's like worse. I mean, I mean, how's that any better? <laughs> oh yeah, because like you and yourself, if you were to tell someone, "Well, I don't want you to think I'm like Ted Bundy," you're thinking someone thinks I'm Ted Bundy, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's sort of planting the seed in their mind. They'll be like, "You know what? He is like Ted Bundy." Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, though, is the opening one. It's like, oh, there's so there's so much room for a good Selena Byrne to Bruce in there when he's like, you know, you might think I'm a Norman Bates type and she might be like, well, I see that you keep one desiccated old mummy about the house anyway. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh mm-hmm. bad. Oh. Like Alfred coming out, what did you say, miss? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe he'd like it. Oh, good one, man. <laughs> You're good. You got me. He, just, lay- <laughs> he just lays on the horn in the car. <laughs> he's cut back to him outside the manor honking on the horn. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, come <laughs> Just make sure uh, to put on okay, his little bowler hat too. Go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, uh, I find this whole date though, bar the the creepy Ted Bundy Norman Bates stuff. I find it very formal and civilized. It's very nice, isn't it? I would have imagined Selena would have been written to be more like a, a temptress to Bruce, you know, driving him wild and into doing things he wouldn't normally do. But no, they're having a nice chat by the fireside. I think it's like much like a cat. She doesn't really. Yeah. She doesn't need. She doesn't need Bruce. She's not there to tempt him. She's like, I'm just here from for myself. Ah, and if for I sport, should, even. yeah, if shouldn't should happen. Fine, but I don't need this guy. Like it's, it's you know, mm-hmm. I'm just here for, just for the sake of being here, really. Like a like a cat and its prey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Messing mm-hmm. around with a mouse. You know. Uh, I think I think the inverse was seen a little bit, in, and it's probably completely different stories. But I would atone it to um, the um, Talia Al Ghul again in Rises. They had their fireside get together, and she did. Oh, it was have, a get together. Yeah, she did have motive behind that, and it wasn't cat like where it's I don't need Bruce. It is I need Bruce to do this thing to get my way. Mm. So <laughs> <laughs> I do remember though seeing that scene. For some reason, I don't mind this fireside scene, but in Dark Knight Rises, Mm-mm. at that point, it was such a cinematic cliche yeah that it was like oh yeah. god what the hell are you doing it was awful it was awful mm-hmm. yeah um I, I mean and maybe this is what's working and maybe now that i think about it maybe this is what went wrong with those comic books that try to like marry off batman and, and catwoman and have a happy ever after is um like something i noticed because i i'm a certified cat dad i have two cats hey. he has a cat mm-hmm. and uh it's like um uh, they the best way to get their attention to get their affection and to love you is to completely ignore them like <laughs> yeah. just don't even want their attention don't try to go like pet them don't if you just ignore them they come to you and they're like oh pet me i want to be loved yeah. i want to be like and it's like oh how about i just ignore you and then you love me e- even and better so ignore Bruce... them and open a book that seems to <laughs> really annoy them it's like wow what are you doing why are you looking at that thing <laughs> give your undivided attention to something else and i think with catwoman it's like if you try to go if you try to hunt down catwoman you know like in like this romantic way and it's like she's gonna leave she's gonna like yeah. go off they, they don't want that they don't want all that attention um but then if you play like this like mysterious you keep that facade up and so catwoman selena's like oh like i want to like I'm, I'm baited now more towards like mm. trying to get to know who you are and stuff like that. It's like I want you to want me in this like cat and mouse game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think they're like deep down. We saw in just a few minutes back actually, Selena started becoming kind of conflicted for the first time since changing. She she started turning back into herself every now and then in a sort of schizophrenic kind of way. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. what, what was it she said now? When she was looking in the window of the she shop, she... Uh, asking her reflection, why are you doing this? It seemed why are as you if, doing this? Yeah. yeah, it was like the shock had worn off of everything. And she was like, oh, yeah. wait, wait a minute. This is crazy. <laughs> so I think she, as, as herself, the Selena that she thought was dead and hidden, she really does like Bruce there. That, that's there, definitely. They have a thing. Mm-hmm. I do also like, too, that, again, like, if you bring it back to what we've seen of Bruce Wayne 
in the, the Michael Keaton Bruce Wayne in his previous romance is trying to explain himself to women. It's actually a good. This seems a nice counterpart to uh, Shovegate. Remember from the the first yes. movie when he shoved Vicky Vale in the chair. It's like I was like, "You're a nice girl. I like you a lot, but you right now just shit down and shut up." And then he started that whole mumbly, oh, you know, you know when a guy gets up and you have breakfast and all this <laughs> kind of crap. And it's almost as if when she's saying like, you know. Or the, uh, the truth frightener. It's almost as if he's about to go into like a mumbly, like how can I explain this kind of thing? And it's yeah, like, no, oh, this that's two... exactly what I thought. Yeah, there's two, there's two truths and all this business. But then it seems as if like Selena is able to kind of cut through all that. He's, he almost has a moment of like, ah, I should I should just be kind of clean cut about what's happening here rather than try to bullshit with the whole. But it's like, well, you know, like some people have a thing where they do this thing. You know? <laughs> no, again, though, I thought. Like in the last movie, right? Like he says, there's two truths. And it sounds to me, yet again, like he's about to reveal that he's a serial cheat or something. He's married. He's like, there's these two different sides of me. Because <laughs> remember, Vicky instantly thought, oh, he's married. Oh, God. <laughs> but do I also like, though, when he's talking about, like... Um... You know, there were two truths, and, you know, she had trouble reconciling them because he had trouble recon- reconciling them. But the look on Selena's face is a real look of recognition of, like, I totally understand what you mean. Mm, There's yeah. no, like, again, with the head, this, he said this to Vicky. She might have, well, actually, in that last movie, he did try to explain things to Vicky. And he was like, Do you know what I mean? And it cut to her going, No. But Selena <laughs> does. She totally understands what he means, even though he has been sort of vague. And kind of like, maybe I don't know what I'm quite saying yet in this sort of business. So I like that as a, a, a you know a nice bit of facial acting from Michelle Pfeiffer there. Just well, yeah. do, well done writing as well. So Yeah, I, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a good takeaway is the nonverbal acting from mm. Michelle Pfeiffer. That was something like, as you watch it, you, you get a little bit more from not just the delivery, not just the way the words are being said from the screenplay, but the... The almost like oh I should be smiling I should be like en- like enjoying this conversation but instead I I'm learning maybe a little too much like maybe I'm 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 afraid of what I'm learning in in a sense that it it's a little too close to how I feel like I'm relating a little too much yeah and it's like it's like oh yeah yeah I understand it's like and it's it's one of those things um, that that you only get from that smile that that quick like oh i should react with a smile like i like i'm following along mm. um it's one of those things that i that i really really enjoy um and yeah it, it's absolutely nonverbal acting i think that as a whole gets underappreciated um especially from these type of characters that have this facade this this mask on their on their real mm. actors you know, I think that's completely underappreciated. Um, and, and like, this is why I think this film works. Uh, it's so much better than the original. And, like, m- it helps having that dichotomy of, like, what Vicky Vale was and then Michelle Pfeiffer's character. Mm. Uh, it, it's, it's that, like, going from that film and then this one. It's such a response to the way uh, Tim Burton did the first one. And I think he did that on purpose. Yeah, I think it definitely was on purpose. And I, I've always thought that, um, and I didn't know how it was reviewed, because I think at a time when I was watching these movies, I didn't quite understand the concept of sequels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was always just like a newer, like, oh, it's just his another, girl- Yeah, another girlfriend. They don't have it things. And now I'm, I'm, you know, watching it minute by minute and analyzing it. You said, Mark, that uh, it's a play on the good storytelling. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, the screenwriter and everything like that, it makes it seem like, um, where Vicky and that relationship fell short and like the kind of obvious nuance of that's never going to work out. She's just a pretty girl. Can't love Batman kind of thing where that Chris Pratt, that was Chris Pratt. (laughs) Um, (laughs) so when you bring it over to Michelle Pfeiffer's Selena Kyle, it makes it seem like they were, they had that intentionally in mind where it was like, Hey. She has to be not exactly the opposite of Vicky Vale, but in the line of understanding. And mm-hmm. I don't know. It was now. It's like, oh, I want to actually watch these together as a sequel and like have to think. You know what I mean? Instead of it just being, mm-hmm. here's Avengers two. I want to be yeah. like, okay, Batman eighty nine contained self story, cool, awesome. 
Batman Returns, check it out. Here's the sequel to this really compelling story, and mm-hmm. it gets a little bit more deeper. Yeah, yeah. Now I gotta. Yeah. Now I'm older. And uh, you know, like Tim Burton, you, you know, uh, going back to that documentary, uh, "The Death of Superman Lives." Uh, Tim Burton was almost going to direct that Superman Lives movie. Yes, and uh, he he wanted to to evolve the Superman story like he did with um, Batman Returns, and he said that Batman Returns was his way of uh, correcting his mistakes from the first film. Mm-hmm. You know, he did Batman, and then he was like, "I realized I could do better." Yeah, and I did better with the sequel. Yeah, like oh, I, I agree I, like, with him. I, I did a, oh, yeah. a better film. Uh, learning from the first one, mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, yeah, and dude. it's parts like these where you actually can see that, yeah, and, and it, that's what I said. It makes you think. It's nothing's again. We we don't use the term spoon fed. I don't hate to be spoon fed, especially when it comes to like comic book movies. I and I'm enjoying having to think about the two characters right now, knowing what I know about Bruce Wayne and Selina. That on screen they are figuring it out. The, you know, the two of them. It's mm-hmm. just it's fantastic. Mm. I also like as well. Just even talking about like. Not just Michelle Pfeiffer's facial expressions, but even the body language. Because at the beginning of this date, when they were sort of being a bit catty, actually, for want of a better word, with each other, <laughs> that she was sitting, you know, hands in lap, kind of like slightly awkward. And then as soon as they started to get into this deep conversation about like, oh, you know, told her everything, her arm goes up like in a very relaxed manner over the top of the chair, which is really easing into like, oh, so the truth frightened her. Like she's now either seeing an opening of like. Well, now things have got interesting for me, and it's you know we're we're being honest with each other rather than this sort of awkward sitting and just like oh so you're gonna turn on the tree lighting like that kind of thing. It's just uh yeah it's just very nicely done. It's almost as if Michelle Pfeiffer's a good actress. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> almost as if who would have thought? Yeah, it's uh, having two great actors on screen at one time. What impossible? <laughs> mm. How the could novel they even do that. In a comic book movie? In Get out. <laughs> in a Christmas movie? <laughs> hey, Get out of here. That's what I'm talking about. Um, in, I mean, not to get too artsy with it, but I'm sure some people have uh, noted that the, 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 there is parallel mm-hmm. between them. You know, like they're literally sitting in the same position yeah. with the arm over the, 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 the back of the sofa or whatever. Yeah. Love seat. Love seat. <laughs> and it, it is one of those things where it's like they're parallel in the way that they're sitting because they are equals now, mm-hmm. whereas Vicky Vale and Bruce Wayne or Batman were were two different types of characters. You yeah. know, they were complete opposites. And um, a part of, I don't know, a part of me has never really uh, remembered Vicky Vale. You yeah, know, just the name. Yeah, <laughs> like mm-hmm. yeah, we know it's like we know that he had a love interest in the last film, but I never felt like that was. Um, Because I even felt like Nicole Kidman's character in Batman Forever, like that love interest, had somewhat of more of an edge to her that it that it felt more kind of necessary. She was like a psychiatrist. Yeah, she she had like something about her that kept her interesting Mm -hmm. Um, and and a little pivot more pivotal to the plot. But Vicky Vale had always seemed like. Diet Lois Lane. You were there. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm, I mean, Diet I, Lois Lane. Mm, I like her in the movie. Fine, <laughs> but you, you're right. And most people, most people don't remember her. She's not really been. <laughs> I she's never it, been mentioned again. I think it's been. It's quite telling because we were really, we really were won over by Vicky in the first movie because we were looking at it minute by minute. We had to spend so much time with her. At the end, we're like, oh, mm-hmm. Kim Basinger is really, really good in this. Was like, oh, I really like Vicky Vale the character. But it's quite telling that since season two has started. We've mentioned Knox more than we've mentioned Vicky Vale in recalling <laughs> yeah, things from yeah. the first movie because the lack of Knox. Yeah, it's, nowadays it's just more like, yeah, so Vicky Vale's gone, but we keep bringing up. I guess Knox that that meant more to us, but he left more of an, an impression because now you've moved on to like, oh, and Bruce Wayne's on to a much more interesting love interest, uh, a much more compatible relationship, and it seems for all the love we gave Kim Basinger and Vicky Vale, it's like, yeah, well. It's kind of good, though, that she didn't come back because we're getting something much better with this movie in terms of at least the romantic interest that that Bruce has here. Yeah, well. yeah and I think, uh, I think this kind of goes back to what John and I were talking about. Like, it, it's better that it doesn't work out because I think that's maybe maybe that's why it's more memorable. Maybe maybe our knowledge, uh, our awareness that this doesn't end well is is more proof that this is a better uh, scenario, like a better, yeah, I don't know how to say it, but like maybe, 
maybe it's the fact that we know that this doesn't end well that it's more memorable mem- more memorable to us that's a good point because how would it develop you know into into a good relationship really would she just stop being catwoman all of a sudden and just be his girlfriend like but yeah and i guess if, if that's how ha- if it had ended that way you know if they were like you know if there was a happy ending we wouldn't have uh cared so much about it because we don't go um we don't it's how do you, how do you say it? it's just like uh okay we know how it ends they're just gonna get together it's 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 like expectation and then we meet the expectation it's it's kind of boring <laughs> that is that's actually the um i don't know if you guys know but like in the, the sam ham draft like the first ever draft of batman 2 as, as it was called vicky was still a central character and it ended with bruce proposing to her and stuff and there was you know yes, catwoman yeah. was in there and there was a bit of contention like oh she's a bit flirty with bruce and stuff but it was you know at the end of it, it's like yeah this is actually quite a dry story though did you come to this conclusion like yeah they're still together and guess what? At the end, they're still together, and it's very, very boring. <laughs> <laughs> that is boring. It's, yeah, I like the way with these two, though. You know, even if you don't know what's going to happen at the end, say it's the first time you're watching it, I think you you, you know really deep in your heart this isn't going to work. Yeah, like, and that's that keeps you watching. You're like, oh. Like it, it keeps you looking for signs and clues and things because there's no way this could work out on the surface level. Yes, but, you know, with this facade they're presenting to each other, yeah, that seems nice. But what you know of them, it's not gonna end well. It might end in a fight. It might not. But they're not gonna be together by the end. I just wonder if Tim mm-hmm. Burton just has the thing with that. I'm trying to think beyond because obviously the most recent film he had to this was Edward Scissorhands, which all, all also ends in a. A, ro- a romance that you want to work out, but just due to circumstances, just can't ever work. So the two people who are in love are just separated by by everything. But then the other movies, like I guess Beetlejuice ends in a happy ending because yeah, everyone yeah. everyone's quite happy at the end of that. Get Sweeney Todd, I guess like well they <laughs> kill each other, <laughs> but I don't think does he have any other what, what what's his sort of outlook on these things of like he, he obviously Nightmare Before Christmas even though it's not a Tim Burton movie it's uh even though he's got him all over it uh that has a happy ending but uh I'm trying mm-hmm. to think of any of the are there any other doomed romances in Tim Burton movies mm-hmm. I guess you have Big Fish him and Allison Lohman I can't remember I think they mm-hmm. they, said- they successfully get together as well so <laughs> you said Edward Scissorhands right yeah mm-hmm. yeah. yeah okay I'm racking my brain now. It? I'm like, okay, what was the first film? Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and then oh yeah, because we all know Pee Wee gets a girl at the end of that movie. Mars oh, yeah. Attacks. Pee Wee gets no it all. Love interest. What happens at the end of Mars Attacks? I think there's no main protagonist. No, there's no love interest. I think though, the, the, no. Mars Attacks does end with um, the reunification Happy of uh, Jim Brown with Pam Greer and stuff like that. That family gets back together. So they they work out. Yeah, uh, yeah. You do have the doom romance between. Oh yeah, she was in that movie. Oh, <laughs> mm-hmm. she's the mother. Oh, I love that. I guess it's the doomed <laughs> romance between Pierce Brosnan and Sarah Jessica Parker's head, but uh, <laughs> or the two heads of Pierce Brosnan and Sarah yeah. Jessica Parker. But they die together, yeah. so it's like, oh, I guess they kind of things kind of worked out. At least they died together. <laughs> <laughs> kind of worked out the text. What a great movie. Oh. I love that movie so much. It is amazing. <laughs> this, this is weird, though. Are we discovering that Tim Burton's an optimist? Yeah, so maybe he just <laughs> had a brief Ooh, period of this time where he's like, you know what? Relationships don't work. This kind of sucks. And then maybe he got into a really good relationship. <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm... I mean, the dude's doing Batman stuff. He's had to have his, like, emo moments. So he's just <laughs> yeah. like... Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't, I've never... Like, Tim Burton, he's a good storyteller. And I don't think he... I don't think all his, like... A testament to him is like none of his stories are um, the same. Yeah, they're not trying to prove the same point over and yeah, over yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, he's not trying to hit you over the head that like love sucks or anything like mm-hmm. that. But this film is that, and I think that's why um, I think that's why this one works so well is because uh, by the end of and I, I think that's probably why it works so well for the audience and why people love it so much. And it's definitely why I love this movie so much, and since this is like the last time we'll be talking about this movie um it's like the reason i really like this movie is because 
uh, it is very honest about how relationships work sometimes. Mm -hmm. And as much as we want something and like you want to be with some person and that person wants to be with you, but it just, it's not going to work out. It is not going to happen. And so like there, I'm sure we've all had those things happen in our own lives where we tried to be with someone that we have fallen in love with and maybe didn't plan on falling in love with them. And like it happens and it's so gut punchingly like it feels awful to have that happen to you. And, and like, that's the reality of it. And so by the end of this film, when when they're having that, that, that ball moment and they kind of have like a revelation of who they are, it's like, um, there is a trying to save one another, but it's, it's doomed. It's been doomed from the start. And I guess they're just now realizing it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's, that's why it's working so well. Um, the, the idea that you, uh, you know, from the first film, you're introduced to someone who's just going to be the love interest by the end of the film is not real. It's boring. It just, it's a, uh, it's like a, f- that is fake. That like, that to me is like, that's not, that's not real, mm-hmm. but this is real and it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Spot on. I think I'm just looking up actually just to see if there's, cause you know, sometimes you can see, say with James Cameron, for example, where like, obviously he had like a, uh, very strong female presences and very strong female characters in his movies. And then he went through a divorce around the time of true lies. And one of the most memorable scenes is like the humiliation of Jamie Lee Curtis's character when she's forced to yeah. strip for Arnie and stuff. It's like, is, are you going through some, something here, James? We're like, it seems weirdly coincidental that that just happened around the time you're getting divorced. But the, I wonder like to see if there is anything you compare with the uh, Tim Burton's relationship history. So I've briefly got it up here. Uh, but I did note that apparently he was married to a German artist called Lena Jaisecki, and their marriage lasted uh, about four years, and they got divorced in '91. So just around the time he was making this movie, oh. just around the time, oh. just after Edward Scissorhands, uh, and then he—that's the same reason that a Temple of Doom is so dark, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. uh, Spielberg was going through. Was he? No, he had just he had just been through a divorce. Was yeah, that and it? then Lu- um, Lucas was going to Lucas was going through a divorce. <laughs> But then after that, he was in a relationship with someone from, uh, you know, 92, I guess when Batman returns in the can, potentially. Uh, and then they stayed together up through uh, uh, to 2001. So I guess that's during the whole Mars attacks period and all as well. And then after that, he goes to 2001's when Planet of the Apes comes out. And that's when he hooks up with Helena Bonham Carter. Of course, they they were together for a long, long time. But uh, nowadays, though, you might see like this Dumbo movie just has like... A tragic romance in it as well, where it just like, it ends with Dumbo and Cat Girl could never be together or something like that at oh, the end. Oh no! <laughs> you heard it here first. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be like. Uh, I mean, there is a doomed relationship almost with Dumbo and his mother, right? So that's like that. Even that could be a painful thing, where it's like some people just are stripped away from who they love and like. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't have to be like a love interest, a love interest in that kind mm-hmm. of way, but like more of like a family love interest. Like, yeah, like is, that's going to be sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll see, see what happens. Uh, be one, one, God, of no, uh, beyond the fact now of almost kind of obligation to the podcast, I have no interest in Dumbo. <laughs> like, nothing about it is winning <laughs> me over. I'm like, I know it's going to be really smalty as well. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a try. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll yeah. probably cry because I'm a, a wimp yeah. <laughs> i cry yeah, I mean, at star wars you know? <laughs> hey hey i cry at star wars <laughs> excellent i'm not alone yeah nothing wrong with that yeah i used to get choked up about that padme scene at the end of dude when anakin yells i hate you oh yeah, yeah like, waterfall anakin you're breaking my heart oh. i'm like oh you're breaking my heart yeah <laughs> i'm not even like hugely into the prequels or anything that i don't think they're great movies but those sort of scenes get me i'm like oh god yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm a um, sucker for emotion. Mm-hmm. I think what is it? I was like not even about like the Jungle Book remake that Disney made, and then I saw it on Netflix, and I was like, I love this so much. It's so great. <laughs> what nice and uh, like maybe I always feel like it's gonna be one of those things where it's like I never saw um, Beauty and the Beast, and mm-hmm. um, you know they're doing Lion King and and Dumbo, and I'm like. I'm sure it's going to be the same thing where it's like, I'm not interested in go in to see it, but once it's out on streaming, I'll watch it and I'll go, this is so great. <laughs> it's like, a, it's like, I don't know. I'm sure it's good. It'll no. be good. Disney won't put out a bad film. <laughs> no. oh, will it? 
hopefully. Uh, but uh, but of course, though, within the minute, we do actually get, uh, the, I think, pretty much the only direct, you know, deliberate callback to the first movie in the mention of Vicky Vale. The fact that Bruce Wayne was in a relationship with Vicky. And of course, then Selena does it, kind of laughs at the name, like, oh, Ice, Ice Skater Stewardess. Which I don't quite get, because it's like, well, what's wrong with the name Vicky? Like, what's... Yeah. Well, first, what's wrong with Vicky? Also, Selena yeah. is a weird name. <laughs> and she, well, she, she's she's only a secretary as well, so why is she looking down on people? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So this is in the, uh, better now. the aftermath of the Tanya Harding thing, where Tanya Harding was skating to the Danny Elfman Batman theme. It's like, what the hell is this? What's this <laughs> anti-ice yeah, yeah, yeah. skating attitude that Selena's got? <laughs> Maybe, maybe he didn't like her performance. <laughs> hmm. I wonder if Vicky was seen as like one of those like uh, like names like Tiffany or Brooke, where it's Ugh. like yeah, you got, yeah, That's exactly. Like exactly. Name. No offense if your name is Tiffany or Brooke, but that yeah, there, there's been you, stereotypes. You usually, yeah, it's a stereotype where it's uh, you got a little uh, maybe there's some missing teeth yeah. in there. But it is hard um, to imagine <laughs> meeting like a guy called like Chad and not been a bit like. What yeah, was oh. <laughs> welcome to America. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, thank God that's not really a name here. <laughs> it's all. Nope. But uh, I did also do a little, uh, just a little dive into uh, Batman and Bruce Wayne's actual dating history. Like you know, we we've obviously touched on Vicky Vale quite a bit in the last movie. But who else has Bruce Wayne been hooked up with? Who are the main loves of Bruce Wayne's life? And originally, uh, introduced in Detective Comics 31, his first kind of main and quite long-running uh, recurring character was Julie Madison, who was originally an actress who hooked up with Bruce. And uh, they were, you know, um, apparently she pushed him away because she wanted him to give up the, the playboy lifestyle. But he refused. And so mm-hmm. obviously... It wasn't that. It was that wasn't what he was refusing. It was obviously he was refusing to give up his cover, and you know. you know, But imagine from her point of view, he's refused to stop being a playboy. Are you jerk? Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? And then there's obviously in because the, that's all in Earth Two, with the, you know the Golden Age, and then in Prime Earth, much more convoluted story where her father was Mallory Madison, the arms dealer who sold the gun that was used to kill the Waynes. Uh, Which in itself is like that's too much. And then at one point, Bruce gets amnesia, like they're dated. Bruce gets amnesia, forgets that he's Batman, and then her and or him and um, Julie hook up, and Alfred is kind of like, yeah, let's keep this going, uh, like uh, just letting them forget that he was Batman for a while until it gets so bad in Gotham that Alfred's like, we need Batman, and then they go and jog Bruce's memory, which means means the two of them seem like really awful people that are just letting this guy forget a huge chunk of his own life. That's horrible. But uh, I guess mm-hmm. we'll be going on a deeper uh, dive with Julie Madison in two years' time because she's actually played by Elle McPherson in Batman and Robin uh, in a very brief cameo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but beyond that, of course, then you have Vicky Vale was the next big uh, love interest. Uh, Selena herself then was a major feature of the comics for many years up to about uh, 1974 when they introduced Talia Al Ghul uh, of course the daughter of Raja Al Ghul and who then he's you know in recent years they had their son Damian Wayne who became Robin etc etc sure people listening to a podcast about Batman know all these things already but uh, I actually didn't hey you never know yeah, I didn't actually realize though it's always, looking yeah. into Talia though that she was voiced by in the anime series she was voiced by Helen Slater of course, played Supergirl back in the eighties. Like I never knew that. That's crazy. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it's a, it's Talia Al Ghul. That's been like one of my, I think, my least favorite relationship between like Batman and someone in the comics. I always always felt like um, it was like a jump the shark thing. No, oh. it, it's it's more like uh, she she just thinks he's she's better than him in like this, like oh like. I don't know. It's like dating like a really rich person and having to meet the rich family and being like, oh, you're not good enough. You know, you know what I'm talking about? And yeah. It's like, why even bother my guy? Like, I don't even want like, I don't know. I don't know if you guys have been in a relationship like that, but it's like bogus. You're like, <laughs> I, you know what? I'm out. <laughs> and so like, it always bothers me the Tally Al Ghul thing because it's like, what are you guys even attracted about? You just attracted physically? Like, is there even like, are you guys actually in love with each other, or is this just like a yeah. like genetic a, thing? Yeah, just like oh, we're superior beings 
like some Egyptian status type thing. Like mm-hmm. we should like uh, royal, uh, like medieval royal weddings, like uh, arranged marriage. That, <laughs> mm-hmm. I hate that concept. It bothers me so much. So it's like, I guess that's why I've never liked it. <laughs> my, my, my main yeah. memory of uh, Tali Al Ghul, the thing I always associated with her now with, because I just love that as a moment in the cut scenes of Arkham City. There's a bit where obviously they meet up mm-hmm. and uh, Bruce to get a little bit of the the uh, what we call it, the the pit the Lazarus pit. Uh, the the she has to go undergo like the demon trials. This is going to be the boss fight with Raja Ghul. But before he goes in, like Talia is still trying to like kind of obviously has the hots for him and stuff. And she's just like, well, you know, you know, when you go in there, you're gonna be you're gonna be alone. I can't help you. No one can help you. You'll be by yourself. And he just kind of looks at her and he's like, like always. And then she has this very sassy like. Oh well, that, I hope I hope you're okay. Like a real like, let the let the gods be kind. <laughs> and it's just a real thing of like, yeah, her throwing herself at Batman and him being like, yep, go f- yourself. <laughs> just like I'm staring off with my usual yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. People like anyone who I don't know if anyone out there like is actually a, a fan of the Talia Bat relationship. Uh, I guess shoot me a message uh, why because <laughs> it's always just seemed like pure sexual fantasy it's always just been like oh it's a she, taboo yeah. she's hot she's a super villain mm-hmm. she, like i want to see batman with her and it's like all right nerd <laughs> like but yeah, it's actually whatever. quite telling not my not my batman even, even the, at the end of arkham city like the fact that the, at the end of that of that game the, the talia dies at the joker's hand and then the joker dies and in the aftermath, Batman is much more emotionally sort of distraught by the fact that the Joker is dead than, than like, he let the Joker mm-hmm, die and yeah. the fact mm-hmm. that Talia is dead as well. So it's just like, yeah, that's where even the, the writers yeah. of the story are just like, oh, of course, well, who gives a shit about her? But, but the, the Batman, yeah, the Joker she, she, died, that's a big deal. She dies in the most abrupt way that I was almost like, wait, did she die? Or is it like, it, it feels so like, I don't know what to do with this character. <laughs> Just get Kill rid of her. Him. It's yeah. it's so almost bad. It almost like I always am not a fan of that part because it, it's they don't even mention her after that. It's just like she was there. And now yeah. she's not. I don't know. It was it was <laughs> wacky. Not a fan. <laughs> two out of ten. <laughs> oh, that's that's a uh, that's a big number too yeah. from your description. <laughs> I thought it would have been zero. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, a for effort, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, but oh, um, other. Uh, love interest to Batman include uh, Julia Pennyworth, who is uh, Alfred's daughter, which was a thing for a, a while. Uh, Alfred had a daughter with French resistance fighter Mill Marie. Uh, so yeah, Julie, Julia Pennyworth showed up in the early eighties, uh, but then you know, because Vicky and Nocturna, who was another Batman love interest and villain, what a great like, name! Because she was around. Uh, yeah, Julia just just buggered off basically at some point just had enough uh but yeah of course then that also mm-hmm. is uh nocturna nocturna is weird because it's basically poison ivy like they've kind of done a lot of the poison ivy stuff with a different character uh because nocturna was mm-hmm. a, a natalia knight and she was a jewel thief who briefly adopted jason todd and then you know knew that bruce wayne was batman but she, and she suffered from uh, a light sensitivity disease that bleached her skin white so if you knew someone whose skin was bleach white and you're Batman, it's going to be a bit weird where you're like, you remind me of somebody else I know. <laughs> <Is> it... <laughs> I, I can't quite put my finger on it. But yeah, her big thing was that she had a special uh, sort of drug that she uses as a perfume, which caused every man to fall in love with her. And then it happened with Batman until he snapped out of it. And it's like, that sounds like someone else very familiar to Batman fans as well. <laughs> but, the, but of course, there's other, you know, many, many more uh, Batman hookups, like Wonder Woman, freaking Black Canary and stuff. He's obviously a yeah. character over 70 years old. Obviously, he's hooked up with a lot of people. But the, those are, the, those are yeah. kind of the main ones, really. But um, Yeah, Wonder Woman, that one always to me was like, I think Wonder Woman can do better. Like I think Wonder Woman can like literally have uh, anyone she wanted to. Like if she actually, I don't know. I think there's so many. Like I would curate that relationship better than oh she has an interest in Batman. It's like uh, like uh, Nate, you got me into reading Superman Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. I thought that was fantastic. I was okay with that. That mm-hmm. made a lot of sense to me. 
uh, Wonder Bats, that relationship, I've always been like, that that seems like fan service and it doesn't calculate like it should or like it doesn't calculate at all. And I think people are trying to make it and I never believed it. But the I think Andrea Beaumont was the character from Mask of the Phantasm. Um, yeah. And and she would to me is the exact same is same romantic dilemma as this movie. And so that's why I think it's uh, a plus. Mm. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, because we're still getting, uh, you know, Bruce pops in and tells like, oh, that uh, Vicky was a you know photo, photo journalist. And then she, Selena asks him, like, was Vicky right about your difficulty with duality? And then this is, of course, when he comes out with the Ted Bundy, Norman Bates thing. But again, I do like that he's about to kind of go into like a, you know, he, he's almost drawing his breath and just go into like a mealy mouth explanation of trying to dodge around the issue. But then he almost does have a kind of like, I should just be honest with her. And it's like, well, if I do, if I tell you, then you're going to think that I'm like a Norman Bates, Ted Bundy type, <laughs> which is, I, you know, as we were discussing earlier, probably not the right thing to say to somebody who you brought around to your house. But It's a weird yeah. thing to bring up. Yeah. When you're this aloof, strange, rich guy who's brought a woman round to his cavernous mansion that's almost impossible to escape <laughs> from. <laughs> she just turns around like Alfred's there with a like a, an axe or something. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time though he is at least laying the cards out on the table like he's not saying all right oh i'm batman but he's like well if i tell you this what what the deal is you're gonna think that i'm like a psycho basically so at least you know the the walls have come down like he's he is preparing more so than he was with the uh, with vicky to sort of to open up because he obviously wasn't with he didn't open up with vicky like it was alfred had to do that for him so with this one though he's almost prepared to you know let it all go himself. Yeah, maybe that's another thing with um with Batman being kind of like not right in the head where it's like what are you doing you <laughs> you just you like just not thinking straight my guy you're just not like you dress up first of all as a bat and you go and fight crime and then it's like now you think you just what like you're just going to confess yourself and like then a happily ev- ending is just gonna like it, like show up out of thin air it's like <laughs> you're not you're not, it, batman has um i think we always give batman too much credit for being so calculated and and like sure he might have contingencies because he's a paranoid guy mm. but it's like to me he's it makes sense that batman would be this kind of like you're not putting two and two together. Like you're not thinking about how this actually boils down um, because you're so uh, captivated by the pathos of everything and the theatrics and, and all that. And you get carried away with the adventure of it all because that's like your outlet. And so like, to me it makes sense, but it's also one of those things where it's like, yo, this doesn't make any damn sense whatsoever. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, of course, then Bruce does move in. He kind of moves in for the, at least verbally moves in for the kill with like, and yeah. then you might let me let me kiss you. Like, oh, oh, he's he is moving things along right here. I guess though he is on a at deadline. At least he's so. looking for cons. Yeah, at least he's looking for consent. Though. Yeah, that is true. Because in in the pre, I mean, that's a good thing anyway. But in the previous film. With Vicky, he got a little bit too hands-on, I well, felt. Re- it was a bit uncomfortable for recall, a while. recall when he hooked up with Vicky, she was blind drunk, and he was... Yeah. <laughs> he seemed to be completely sober. <laughs> and it was like... I mean, we had a whole thing at the time. Like, I don't know. This is... This, uh, you couldn't put this in a film yep, now. He was pl- plying a woman <laughs> with booze while you're not drinking, and then cornering her uh, like on the staircase. Yeah. <laughs> putting your arms around her and her saying like oh you you don't seem drunk at all and you know i'm you don't seem like you're anything and he's just like oh trust me one drink and i'm flying <laughs> like just, i don't know bruce man this is not <clears throat> this is, maybe you should turn that bat mirror on yourself buddy <laughs> yeah well he's he's learned the error of his ways and here look he's he's asking he's kind of asking i suppose for consent here he's like you know he's reaching there can, can i get a kiss yeah. And metaphysically, maybe Tim Burton is realizing his mistakes. Maybe maybe this is the correction. Yeah. Like you know, like we said, it's like a better film on purpose. And it's like maybe that's another thing where it's like, let's do this right, 
like let's do what like how bruce wayne w- would really be like yeah. thinking about when you're trying to like make batman into like a feature live action film like big hollywood production and it's like tim burton trying to make sure he gets this batman character mm-hmm. i can see how like that initial one with vicky vale is kind of like well what is like this vamp like this dracula type guy who like lives alone and he, like it's i yeah. guess it's like romantic and like a praying vampire type yeah. thing and so like someone might find that romantic but if we're trying to take it into like into the the law of the land at 2018 <laughs> like consent is a huge issue so like that it raises a flag with us but you gotta remember the billionaire guy dressed up like a bat and he's trying to be <laughs> he's, he's not doing he's a crazy he's guy. not always yeah. doing the right thing he's doing the so most of the time he's doing the wrong thing that's the whole point that's true. That's vampire true. guy. <laughs> I, you could say that maybe last time with Vicky, he was he was trying to do what he thinks he's supposed to do. Like I'm supposed to kiss this woman because I'm supposed to have a girlfriend and go out with. It. He wasn't really that interested for most of that movie. Mm-hmm. He was doing it because it's kind of like it. Alfred wanted him to. It's good for his image. Yeah, I should have a woman. I guess he wasn't really. He didn't care. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was the thing, like, Alfred bringing her up to him and him, and like, Alfred, why don't <laughs> yeah. you marry her? Like, it was just a real, like, oh, oh yeah, the thicky, I guess, yeah. whatever. And again, that, like, uh, to get into, like, the meta of it, that's what a lot of people are like today. And I think that's a, um, it's a, it's about education, it's about awareness, and, like, it's for a lot of people, uh, like, they they are taught that they that there is this kind of social construct that, like, oh, like, you have to, you know, you know, like man with woman relationship. Like people yeah. are taught that. And it's like, but they're not taught it correctly. They have to like get what they can from what they, what they consume, like the media that they consume. Yeah. And so like, that is one of those issues where like, you know, Bruce Wayne isn't the most healthy person. And so he, he's like, Oh, well, uh, I have to, you know, do this. And I get the girl, right. I, I, this is the equation and, mm. and, and it's learning that that's not how it works. And I think people fall through that just the same way where they go, Oh, that's not how it should be done. Um, Hopefully that's the conclusion they come to. <laughs> yes. That's, that's the, it's uh it's the ability to recover is, is uh, greater than just doing it right. The first time, you know, you can make mistakes and then you learn from it. You come out better for it. Yeah. But as yeah. long as you're recovering from the mistakes, that's most important. So, I think actually that's because that is the end of the minute. That's got, I'm out of notes myself. So that's the takeaway. Uh, no, well, that's a very that's it for me. That's a very interesting and deep way to end. Uh, I had one last note that would just lower the tone. <laughs> <laughs> As always, John. Jesus Christ, <laughs> I'm gonna have to say it now. I just had one last thing. I just thought at the very last second there, Selena gives him a very. A very sultry, dirty kind of look. You know, she, I think she's got more on her mind than a kiss. Like she, she oh, gives yeah, him totally. the little, she gives him the eye, shall we say? Yeah. Mm. She's like, you know, what would be even more yeah. interesting? If we watch that Christmas light up. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots <laughs> more Go. arousing than that. <laughs> Why don't you just wheel out that TV? <laughs> <laughs> Get that old man to push that TV out. Oh yeah. <laughs> You know who's really hot? Him. That uh, that Mayor Roscoe Jenkins. He's he's a real looker. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing gets me we, hot under uh, the collar like that. When we go take a look at what's under that gold plated dish right there. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I ruined the nice moments that we. Had. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, I, like the biggest takeaway is yeah. Just I you know recover from your mistakes, but also love it painful my guy <laughs> it hurts yeah. uh and and that's why this film is so much greater but um thank you guys for having us on the show it was an absolute blast um if people want to hear more insight and wisdom from nathan and i we covered man of steel where we got to talk about superman and everything that makes him great and dawn of justice which talks about batman as well and superman uh you can find that on dc cinematic minute the dc eu minute on all social media uh, we've talked about Man of Steel, Dawn of Justice, and now we're talking about Suicide Squad. Eventually, we'll talk about Wonder Woman minute by minute, and we'll do Justice League minute by minute, Aquaman minute by minute, and so on. Um, so definitely check that out, and thank you guys once again. Uh, uh, Mark Meadows is my tag, Nate, no clutch Nate, if people want to go talk to us personally. So check it out. Yeah. 
Oh, thank yeah, you for joining us. Thank you. And I'm excited for the Wonder Woman one because that well, before that movie came out, I thought, ah, oh, I'm not really interested. It doesn't look great. <laughs> and then it blew me away. So, <laughs> so I'm very excited <laughs> to hear that. You go and enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, great guests and wonderful listeners. Everybody go and enjoy your day. And uh, join us on Facebook over the over the weekend, of course, at the Bat Minute Listener's Cave. And on Twitter, at Bat Minute. Yeah, we're on Instagram as well. So it's also just... Actually, no, Instagram's different, isn't it, Niall? What are we on Instagram? Is it The I Bat think, Minute? I think it is The Bat Minute, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, Bat so. Minute was taken by some scum, some scumbag. <laughs> we hate you. <laughs> No, we, we don't care. It makes us sound more important to put the at the start. You see. More, <laughs> more important than we have any right to claim to be. <laughs> so join us again on Monday. Sadly, these guys will not be here with us, but we will have new guests and it'll be a new minute. You'll be on minute 73 of Bat Minute Returns. See you then. Next time. Holy f***ing libidos. The crows crackle as a courtship is consummated between an uncowled bat and a declawed cat. But will Bruce's bruises and Selena's scars sustain on a window ledge scupper the progress of their carnal knowledge? Things get hot, hot, hot. Next time, same motherfucking bat pod, different motherfucking bat minute.